Today in our country and around the world, we're experiencing financial problems that are devastating lives. What do we say as a Christian to these problems? Hello, my name is Father Mike Nanning. It's an honor that you're able to tune in and listen to this program. I'm, I'm excited about being able to talk with you because I want to share with you my own personal love for Jesus and how I believe that Jesus and his message and his reality can enter into all the things that are difficult in our life and bring about meaning and bring about hope and bring about life. Well, you and I both know that one of the real struggles we're having today is financial problems. Um, I know that with regard to the ministry and the donations we receive, but oh my, the, the people that have lost their security, the people that have lost their jobs, the people that have lost the ability to go back to school again when they need to do things like that, all, all of these, and, and even the, the amount of homeless people that we have is just so, so very, very difficult. Well, I, I want to, I want to talk to you about that and see if maybe some of the, th I, I want to tell you first a story about, about a, a lady by the name of Paula, but then I want to see if maybe we can take some perspectives on this and see just what does Jesus have to say about the poverty that we, we struggle with. Where is Jesus and what is he trying to say to us in what is a, a very difficult situation? Well, I want to start by telling you the story of a, a, of a lady by the name of Paula. Um, Paula it was 54 years old, and one of her problems in life was that she weighed 350 pounds and she was only 5 foot 2. She was a gigantic woman. You know? um, this, this situation, of course, held her back from so many things. and. It was a real struggle, but in, in addition to this, she had never really been able to get into junior college even, or get to a university, although she was very talented. She was a very, very bright person with regard to understanding things about business, and when problems would come where she would be working, boom, you know, it would be great. Uh, but then, uh, and this was the problem, the eating became an indication of something which is almost like a self-loathing, a, a self-defeating situation that was in her life. And she'd get into a job where she was using her talent for business, but then she'd say something, and then she'd do something, and pretty soon she would find that people were turning away from her. Again, not necessarily because of the weight, but because of the attitude that she had, and she was working for this. Well. She was married to a very fine man, a man who worked very hard. And um, this whole difficulty of this, this struggle with accepting herself and believing in herself um, started to eat on him. And even though he loved her very much, her continually putting herself down just kind of, he started to move away from her. And oh gosh, it moved to such a stage where they actually got a divorce. You know? Um, so now she's living on her own. She has this terrible weight problem. She isn't able to get work. Um, and because she was only in her 50s, she wasn't able to get Social Security. And so <laughs> she was really, really at wit's end. And there was no savings. And yet she had two girls, and the two girls were both in junior college. And oh, and kind of like as she was vicariously trying to live her life in their life, she longed for them to be able to find success, but they had no, none of the amenities as they came back and lived with her that she couldn't help them with their books, she couldn't help them with some of the expenses like even the gas to get to, get to school, and they had to be on their own in a very difficult way. Well, Paula was a person that was filled with fear. There was a fear of things that she didn't even understand, things that were, were, were plaguing her in her life, and she would just, in an unconscious way, find herself shaking, unable to sleep. 
And oftentimes, the only way she could deal with this fear was the escape of food. And that's probably why she got to this big, big state that was the comfort food, if you want, but far beyond just comfort food. It became a deep, deep addiction to food. You know? She would sit and, because of her loneliness, she was able to look at television. and. She would just sit and look at television all day and eat, eat all these things that were fattening, and she couldn't stop. And there was just a real deep frustration. I was able to talk with her one time and tried to get a little bit of an understanding, you know, what's going on here? And you know what I found out? That as a little girl, she had been raped by an uncle very sad situation. And even though this had happened as a little girl and you might think that the memory was gone, no, not at all. She always could remember the, the terror of what it mean in, in the midst of her helplessness to be raped. And ooh, it was just, sudden. and, and, and this, this putting herself down, this continual, you know, that I'm not good, it probably came back with this conviction that because she had been treated so poorly and so viciously by this uncle, that it almost imprinted on her being, you know, I'm no good. <laughs> and so she would prove it to herself and to everybody else by the, the unsightly weight that she had and by the way she would continually fail at the good works she did. You know, again, she was great at business, but oh my, she was always seeming to fail. You know? The problem became so acute now because now she was alone and the husband had really just kind of turned away from her and wasn't giving her any help. And she, and this is what's crazy, even in her pride, she wouldn't take any money from the husband even though he was willing to pay it. Because in her pride when the separation came, you know, I will not take any money. Huh? But look, look what happens. She was going to have to live on the street because there was no payment for the for the apartment in which she was living. She was going to have to live off of food stamps if she could muster the courage to go and even collect the food stamps to get to the grocery store. Well, in the midst of this really dead-end street, she came to me for asking help, and I, I set up an appointment for her. And, it, and as she talked, um, you know, struggling into, to sit in the chair that was in my office, I just tried to listen. I just tried to listen and let her talk. And it was fascinating that as she talked, there were no tears. Um, this whole trauma of the, of the being raped and this whole strong negative feel, feeling for herself had just, whoom, it had just become a, a, like an iron cast metal force in her life that didn't allow her to be a normal person like she would be. I, I suggested to her, what about, what about going to college? She says, no, 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 I can't go to college because when I go to college, I'm too big and I can't sit in the chairs like everybody else and I'd be just totally embarrassed. I said, well, what about going to the internet? And you can do everything at home and you can start to develop that beautiful gift you had because nowadays you can get in there and do that. And there would even be some subsidy that would allow you to cover the cost of that. And then I, I asked her about the possibility of an operation, an operation to perhaps close down the size of her stomach and maybe be a key to doing that. Well, at first, oh boy, you know, she pulled back from it. But then, then she started experiencing the possibility. And I said, you know, what would be wonderful is uh, you're going to lose all this weight and you're going to be beautiful and you're going to even get whistles from guys from the street. And she looked at me, and it was almost like a curse <laughs> that I said these beautiful things would happen. And she was deeply frightened, but she held on. She held on, and I'm, I'm coming to you with the story that she prayed. She prayed to God. She was a deeply religious woman, even in the midst of this battle that was going on of her, of destroying herself with the overweight and whatnot, and destroying herself with not allowing her talents to be used. She called on God. And you know what happened? 
I was able to call her husband, and I told her, I told him that I think that there was something going on in Paula that would allow him to come back. And you know, he did. He did return. And even in the midst of all of this negative feelings that drove him up a wall because he loved her, and yet she kept in many ways pushing him back, he held on and she started to get education. She went in through to the operation, and I've got to tell you today that there's hope. And that's the story of Paula. That's the story of a person who enters in to what seems like a dead-end street in the midst of these financial problems, and there was hope. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to reflect on this story of Paula and allow this to be something that maybe gives you hope in the midst of our world of great, great financial problems. And I want to share with you in just a moment, I'm going to be coming back to you in just a moment, I want to share you with the force of what the Bible has to say to enable us to believe that God can overcome even financial problems. Stay tuned. I am very excited to tell you about a book that I've just written. It's a book for children, and it's a Christmas book. And it's called The Cow, the Wolf, and Lupe. I know that if you were able to get this book and to go through it and perhaps sit down with a little child and read it, that the wonders of Christmas are going to just fill their heart and fill your heart, too, with many blessings. Now, what, what's this story all about? Let me just give you the general outline without perhaps bringing in some of the strong conclusions that are going to happen. It's the story of um, the little girl who was the daughter of the innkeepers in Bethlehem. She gives her insight into just what happened. Then we move on to the cow in the manger. You oh, haven't thought about that. But the cow, she tells us exactly what happened on that very precious night of the nativity. But then, well, I guess this is the really my favorite one. It's the wolf who's out in the middle of the field stalking the lambs, thinking about lamb chops, wanting to get lamb chops, when all of a sudden the angels come and the, the singing comes, the shepherds run away, and in a marvelous, marvelous, touching experience, the little girl, the cow, and the wolf all come together. Now, this book is going to cost $8 plus shipping and handling, and if you'd like to have the video of the program, it's another $2. Now please, get in touch, write us, and remember, you can call that telephone number right at the bottom of your screen. Make sure that you give this special gift to those little children that you love so very much. God bless you. Um, we all know that there's high unemployment. There's a great deal of homes that have been lost. People just don't have the money to pay the mortgage, and so they have to abandon their houses. There's a real struggle also with health care, a lot of controversy as to how we can be able to take care of not only ordinary sicknesses, but sometimes those catastrophic things that come that can turn our lives upside down. One of the real dangers of the world uh, whenever we get into this poverty is the separation between the rich and the poor, and we lose a sense of the middle class, if you will, We've got to be able to have rich people, and there are real blessings, I know, in what we're doing. But there's also the challenge of making sure that we're really taking care of the poor and making sure that we have people that are in the middle. One of the things that I'm struggling with regard, with regard to this, uh, this whole, whole idea of the, of the deal is the, the question of greed. Oh, boy. It can be... It can be such an evil in our life, and it's one of the seven deadly sins. The greed that happens is a greed that isn't able to be satisfied with where we are, but always wanting to have more. You know? Ooh, and that, that goes so bad when we hear of people 
getting millions and millions of dollars and then saying that they're not satisfied with those millions and millions and they want more millions and millions of dollars. And so the greed that we live in can become so, so destructive. I think that as we look at the problems, um, first of all, we acknowledge the fact that they're there. But I say to you, be careful of this problem of the rich and the poor. Be careful of the division that can come, and also be careful of that terrible, terrible thing of greed, that we're not looking over the fence of what's greener and what would be nice to have, and oh gosh, it's so hard because we live in a world in which commercials are all over the place on television and on, on magazines and on billboards, continually enticing us that if you want to be happy, you want to be happy in this life, get this car, get this refrigerator, get this microwave, get this, these clothes, get this house, get all these things, and we can live our whole life dissatisfied with where we are dissatisfied with what God has given us. You know? Well, the important question now comes, and this is what I promised to share with you, is what about Jesus? What does Jesus have to say with regard to this whole problem of poverty? Well, it's important to remember that Jesus related very much to people who were poor. The people who were part of Jesus' class at his time probably had a very difficult time making ends meet. Well, Jesus was born in a, in a place where there was no motel. He had to be in a place where there was no, no, no room for them at the inn. And he was born perhaps in a cave. You know? And we know that his family was born in the town of Nazareth, and that's where he lived. And when you go to the town of Nazareth, they go back and they, they've gone down with excavations around the town of Nazareth. And probably, probably where they lived was in a cave. <laughs> they would dig out places in the earth, and that became their security. Very, very poor. Huh? We know that he was continually caring for the poor in a way that oftentimes made people uncomfortable. There was a mentality in Jesus' time that if you were poor, that was because God didn't love you. <laughs> And so anybody that was poor was kind of put on the side and maybe even not even allowed to come to places of worship like the synagogue or the temple. The real blessing when came when you had all these riches and that's when God loves you. And Jesus goes against that. And he starts speaking about the poor are where we find the kingdom of God. The poor are the people who are close to God. This, this caused all kind of difficulties because the idealism of being rich was so strong. And then when we talk about Jesus and poverty, we can't deny the fact of the image that we see when we walk into church of a naked Jesus, naked, no clothes, hammered, uh, through his wrists and through his feet, completely, completely like he was when he came into the earth. You know? Whew. Whew. That was a tough, tough reality for those that find the, the power of wealth. Jesus was poor. I, I, I think back, too, in his own life, and just imagine, I, we don't think about this too often because we, we know that he's God and because of that divinity there's almost like a, a bridge for any kind of problems that happened. But Jesus was an evangelist, an evangelist who traveled around preaching the kingdom of God. And in doing that, he had to depend on the support of other people. He didn't go out and do something that got a salary like a, like a tent maker or a, a bridge builder or whatever it was. He was preaching and he relied on people's help. And we know from the Gospel of Luke that there were a group of women that gave of their, of their savings to allow Jesus and the disciples and the apostles to go out and preach. But it's interesting he wasn't living in a life of luxury in which he had a whole bunch of savings. He lived in an interesting way. And when we talk about poverty, uh, it's good to remember this prayer that Jesus gave us. Remember the Our Father. And there's, there's a little segment in the Our Father that we say every day, and sometimes we don't realize the full implication of that. 
But Jesus says when we turn to the Father to pray, it's, get this, give us this day our daily bread. That's a fascinating thought because it really speaks of the overwhelming surrender to faith in God to love us and take care of us even when things seem outside to be falling apart with, with the lack of work, with the inability to stay in our home. There's a, there's a challenge that Jesus comes and says, even beyond all of those obstacles that seem so overwhelming, make sure that you pray for this day and that God takes care of us. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's quite a challenge, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm always hoping that I have enough, enough set aside for those rainy days. And yet the message of Jesus was, was quite different. The message of Jesus was a call even to remember, remember that rich man who came and asked him, you know, what do I have to do to gain salvation? And Jesus, and it's a wonderful, wonderful, a wonderful statement. Here's a rich man, and Jesus looked on him with love. Sometimes we think that Jesus is continually putting rich people down. But no, he looked on this rich young man with love. And, the, and, and Jesus told him, if you want to get to heaven, you've got to obey all the commandments. You know, you've got to do that. And Jesus, the young man said, well, I, I do that all the time, you know, like that. What more do I have to do? And Jesus said this interesting, and oh gosh, this, this challenge just reverberates in our world today in which money and control and savings and Wall Street are so very, very important. He said, give up everything you own and then give it to the poor and then come follow me. <laughs> I don't know about you, but those challenging words even speak volumes to me in my own heart. Here I am struggling to try to make this television ministry work, and I'm begging people to be able to send even a dollar to send some help to, to allow us to control. And I'm always looking for, oh gosh, we've got to get new equipment, we've got to get a, we got to get a new uh, switching board, and we've got to get the dimmer lights and all this, all these things that we need, and we don't have them, and, I'm, and I get anxious and I get concerned, how can we pay this small staff that we have that are working so hard? on just the minimum of expenses. And then Jesus says that word, trust me, pray for what you need for food today. And ooh, that frightening call to that rich young man, give up what you have and give it to the poor. It, it speaks of a, a total different perspective on, on life and on what's important. And Jesus comes to us with this overwhelming love for his Father and the conviction that the Father will take care of us no matter what. So please, if you would, join with me in maybe having a little bit more faith, a little bit more trust. And may our prayer be, certainly, Lord, would you, would you take care of security, but also take care of today and let me have the things I need, and let me trust in you, not just today, but for the rest of my life, that you'll never let us go. That's our God. That's the story of real poverty. Real poverty is surrender to the loving care of God. I am very excited to tell you about a book that I've just written. It's a book for children, and it's a Christmas book. And it's called The Cow, the Wolf, and Lupe. It's the story of um, the little girl who was the daughter of the innkeepers in Bethlehem. The cow in the manger. No, you haven't thought about that. But the cow, she tells us exactly what happened. When all of a sudden the angels come and the, the singing comes, the shepherds run away. This book is going to cost $8 plus shipping and handling. And if you'd like to have the video of the program, it's another $2. Now please, get in touch. Write us. And remember, you can call that telephone number right at the bottom of your screen. 
make sure that you give this special gift to those little children that you love so very much. God bless you. I've spoken to you, if I will, of God continually being a source of strength to us, even in the surrender that we make of some of the security that's so important. That having a whole bunch of money and having a whole bunch of security in the eyes of Jesus is really, mm, this might sound rather radical, but it's, it's really secondary to the beautiful gift of faith that God will take care of us. Now that doesn't mean that if we have faith in God that we, we don't have enough food, that we don't have a place to live, and we don't have education, we don't have medical care, all those things that are really important. Yes, that is some of the things, those basic things, but there's a real call in this poverty of Jesus to be concerned, as he said to the rich young man, about giving what we have to people that we encounter in our life that are hurting. That's what we're called to do, and, and that's tough. That's tough in our world of me, 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 and control and security. But finding as you give to other people, the blessings start to roll into your life in ways that you hadn't anticipated. Well, I got to tell you that in, even in the struggles that I have with coming up with money to pay for all the bills that we have and all the things that are difficult with the television ministry, um, I'm flooded by, by grace and blessing, and I'm flooded by donations that people are allowing us to continue, and please keep that going. But I'm getting messages from the iPhone, you know, we have a, an, uh, the, the smartphone app, uh, iGod Today, and uh, in the message that I give every day through this smartphone app, uh, there's a place where you can push a button and you can make a comment to me, and I get these beautiful comments from people sharing with me their, their prayer intentions, but also sharing with me the blessings that the ministry gives to them. Please, may I ask you, would you get in touch with me? Would you make a phone call? Would you send an email to me? Uh, send a letter and allow me to hear what's going on in your life. Is what I'm saying making any sense to you? Um, and share with me, if you would, your, your needs but also share with me some of the blessings that God has given you. Some of the, the maybe you, you've stuck your toe into the water of what it means to really be a person of faith, and you're willing to say, okay, God, I'll try that. And even in the surrender to the fear is going to bring you blessings. Oh gosh, I've, I've got all kinds of emails of people that have written to me. Um, I don't know where these people are from because the email doesn't give that but beautiful stories of lives that are changed. Lord, thank you for them. Thank you for your blessing, and may Jesus' love for you always make you smile.